Hello and welcome to the Stop, Drop, and Knit podcast, episode 82. My name is Lisa. I am a knitter and natural dyer coming to you from Long Island, New York. This is a space where I share all about my knitting projects and a little bit of spinning, but also quite a bit of natural dyeing and what I've got going on in my shop. I have two adorable English Angora bunnies named Felix and Elmer Fuzz, and I am starting to learn how to process their wool, and I'm excited to get spinning with it soon. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, then I hope you will stick around for this episode and consider subscribing to my channel. I have quite a lot to share with you all today. I have a couple small finished objects to share. As always, there are whips, but a couple of those whips are brand new cast-ons that I am excited to share with you. And for spinning today, I'm going to be sharing the progress that I have made processing Felix's fiber into Rolex. And then, of course, there's always natural dyeing to share. Plus, Owen did a little bit of dyeing in with the snow a couple of weeks ago. So I have those dye results to share with you as well. It's a pretty full episode today, so let's go ahead and dive right in and talk about what I'm wearing. I seem to have a little bit of a cold going on today, so I'm a little bit sniffly. So I am drinking some tea. My husband got me this really cute stay wild mug for Christmas. It's got mushrooms on it, so of course I love it. It is absolutely perfect. Right now my tea is very hot, so. There is nothing like a sip of freshly hot tea. I know it's not going to stay that way through this episode, though, because we have so much to cover. (laughs) Okay. So what am I wearing today? I'm wearing a favorite sweater of mine. This is actually one of my most worn sweaters that I've knit. I should probably do a video sometime going through all my sweaters. Is that something you guys would be interested in? I definitely have the few that I wear over and over and over again. And then a lot of the others I pull out once in a while and some others just seem to have kind of gotten forgotten altogether. So maybe that's a good video topic. But this is one of my most frequently worn knits. This is Arbor Vitae by Hohi Locatelli. From several years ago, it was in one of the issues of Pom Pom Magazine. I believe it was one that Nora Gon guest edited. And this was one of those projects that at the moment I saw it, I knew I was going to knit it. This was seriously a stop, drop, and knit project in every sense. So let's see, the party part of it was all at the beginning with all of these fun cables. Hohe Locatelli is such a brilliant designer, especially when it comes to construction. So it started, I'm trying to remember, I mean, it was so many years ago now, but it started with some, you know, fun like shoulder shaping and everything up here. It was knit seamlessly and it's got these gorgeous cables The last thing you do actually is add the little tassels, but the rest of the sweater was kind of a slog to get through. I will admit it took me quite a few months to finish it. Once I got through all the exciting part up here, the rest was just pure like stuck in it in the round, mindless knitting, which was great because I could take it places, but it was also on something like 2.5 millimeter needles, so it took quite a while to finish. But it was so worth it because, as I said, I wear this one all the time. And I find that I actually pull this one out when I need to actually 
look a little bit nicer when, when I'm like going somewhere. Like I had a rehearsal for a gig this evening. And so I put this sweater on, I've got some black jeans with it. And yeah, I just, I feel really put together every time I wear this. So that's what I'm wearing today. I'm not gonna spend any more time talking about it other than to say the yarn that I knit it with. I don't remember the color of it, but it is Neighborhood Fiber Co. Rustic Fingering, though they have since, I think, made their Rustic Fingering base a non-superwash, and I believe this was before that change. So I think that this is a superwash yarn. Um, but it is absolutely gorgeous. I love the like slight marled effect of the colorway there. I've got some little fuzzies there. Oh well. <laughs> so yeah, as I said, it is well worn. So I'll just do a quick uh, closer up of the yoke. I don't know. I'm recording this at night, so there's no natural light happening right now to show you but maybe we can get the camera to focus in on those cables a bit. So yeah, I absolutely love everything about this sweater and would highly, highly recommend it. Super well-written pattern. And yeah, once you get through the fun bit, it's just one of those projects that you can just take with you and you know, it's mindless TV knitting, car knitting, hanging out with relatives you rather not be seeing at the moment knitting you know whatever so okay that is all for what I'm wearing I have just a couple little finished objects to share so let's move on and talk about those okay so finished objects I have two I finished two sweaters two full color work sweaters. That sounds really impressive, but they're little tiny sweaters. <laughs> I knit sweaters for Mr. Moose. So I showed this one last time um, and I had still needed to graft like under the arms and weave in the ends, but it's not blocked yet, but this one is finished. And these are sweaters for Moose. And Moose is wearing the other sweater. Look how cute he is. So, oh my goodness. Hi. Moose is a pattern by Susan B. Anderson. She is like the queen of stuffies. She is amazing. So Moose here is a moose that I knit for Bryce, my husband, for Christmas last year so 2022 and until just this week he's been naked and so now he's got two sweaters to choose from and i think that probably i need to knit a second moose so that this sweater has a moose to go on so last episode i mentioned that i wanted to knit the second moose out of the leftovers from my Feel the Burn sweater, which I naturally dyed with black walnuts in a few different shades of brown. So I've got all the perfect shades of brown to knit myself a second mousse out of all of the leftovers. I just still have to find them, but now I've got a sweater and I just need another mousse. So it's just so cute. It's so cute. I just can't get over it. Like stuffies and sweaters, it's the best thing ever. So, um, yeah, two full-on colorwork sweaters. Mr. Moose approves, don't you? This one is called Vine Sweater. Hi, Felix. You gonna come up? I should knit Felix a sweater. Hi, buddy. If this is Felix, oh, there, there he goes. He never sits for long. That was Felix. Anyway, <laughs> so... Moose is wearing vine sweater, and this one is pine sweater. So I did not block the sweaters yet. I don't know that I'm gonna bother. I thought about it, but then I just, I put this one on and he looks great. He's warm and he's happy. And so I'm not in a rush to block it. 
I think it, it looks really great. So Mr. Moose has just been sitting up here off camera, but on my bookcase. And so, yeah, two finished objects, two colorwork sweaters. I feel like a wizard, <laughs> not really. But so officially I have now finished four objects of my knit 24 in 2024. So if you are just joining me for the first time or you missed last week's episode, I have started a knit along on my Ravelry group. So you can find me at lisajack78 over on Ravelry. And in my Stop, Drop, and Knit podcast discussion group, I'll put a link in the description in this video. I'll put a link to the uh, group where I started a thread for Knit24 in 2024. And anything goes for this as long as you finish it. So I don't care if you cast something brand new on and knit something start to finish, or if you've got like three ends to weave in on a sweater that you knit like 12 years ago, that still counts. Anything counts. The goal is to just finish 24 things in 2024. So after trying to do this last year and falling short of my knit 23, I decided that I had too many long-term whips that I was trying to, or just not even all whips, but I, ha I did. I had some long-term whips, but I also had just some very big projects and not very many small ones. So I'm just trying to get a head start on this year by finishing up a bunch of small things first. And just, yeah, so we are a sixth of the way there, you guys. We have knit four things and that all happened in January. Today is February 2nd, Groundhog Day, when I am filming this, and this video should be up, I think, February 4th on Sunday. So, that is it for finished objects. Should we talk about my whips or should we talk about fresh, brand new cast-ons? I don't know. I think we should, just, we should just talk about whips first. I'll keep you guys in suspense a little bit longer before we get to the two new projects that I have cast on. Okay, so whips. Okay, so for whips, another one of my big goals every year is to work my way through whatever is on my list of lingering whips. So the sweaters for Moose were a couple of little small things on that list, but I also have a couple of sweaters on that list and this one is actually it was already very far along I had done the body completely already so all it needed were two sleeves and so I knit one of them and I am talking about my hush sweater so this is a pattern by tin can knits and I am knitting it from deep stash yarn which is another one of my goals is to you know just work with some of that yarn that has been sitting in my yarn closet for like I mean this was sitting for easily a decade and maybe even longer I think I got it in 2012 so yeah quite a while ago this is um Cascade Eco Duo and it is naturally colored alpaca wool blend. I think it's 70% alpaca and 30% blah, 30% merino, I think. I don't have the label within arm's reach, but I am, well, I said I knit a sleeve, but I still have to knit maybe a little tiny bit more of, of the cuff ribbing before I can bind off. So I just, I ran out of steam last night and I decided I would finish that today and then I still haven't done it. But that one is really close and I've already got the needles ready to go to start the second sleeve. And then I think there's two options for the neck band. I think that there's just ribbing or you can do like a I cord. I want to say it's maybe an I cord. And that's the one I'm going to do, I think, because it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit nicer with like the really cool design of the cables. 
So yeah, again, I don't have any natural light going right now, but you can kind of see those cables. So this yarn just does this natural stripey thing. So the stripes on the sweater are pretty consistent throughout the body. It's just like a gray and a brown yarn, super soft. And the arm striping is a little bit, a little bit more spaced out because the circumference is smaller. So the stripes are thicker, right? That makes sense. So yeah, so I'm, I'm super pleased. I think it is, it's a pretty good length. And I remember trying on the body after I had finished the body and was happy with the length. So once I get this sleeve like off the needle, I'll probably just try it on again to make sure I'm happy with the sleeve length before I do the second one. And then I will be so close to having my first real finished sweater. It's not color work, but you know, it was lingering. I think I put it away when the weather started to warm up because I knew that I wasn't gonna wear it anytime soon. Um, yeah, but I think uh, this is a pretty recent pattern from Tin Can Knits. It released, I don't know, within the last year or two, maybe. It's not, it's not like as old as Love Note, which is the one that everybody's knit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fairly recent as far as their sweater patterns go. And I think that this uh, would look really great in obviously a solid color or like a tweedy yarn anything that would show those cables off really well i think that this is an aran weight yarn and i just i had it in my stash i was looking through patterns and ravelry for whatever the yardage that i had that i could knit and i found the pattern to go with the yarn so the yarn came first and then i looked for a pattern and now we almost have a finished sweater so that's whip number one. The next one I'm not gonna spend too much time on because I did, um, where is it? I need another tissue, guys. I have cold, hang on. This next whip I'm not gonna spend too much time on today because I did share it last time and I talked quite a bit about it then, but it is one that I just cannot put down. So I've been working on the Painting Rainbow Shawl and this is a pattern by Stephen West. And I'm knitting it with my naturally dyed yarns. It's actually all mushroom yarns, all of the different colors. We're knit with mushrooms, except the yellow was with a uh, dog vomit slime mold and the purple was lichen. So we're actually gonna be talking in the natural dyeing section today about lichen, dyeing with lichen and what I've been doing. But um, yeah, all of the other colors came from mushrooms. We're actually gonna be talking about the Cortinarius mushroom as well later on. Um, but yeah, this is like my happy place project right now these days. It takes very long <laughs> to get through one row because it's, it's I think, over 400 stitches by now and every few rows you've got a purl, a row or two. Um, yeah, so it, it's kind of slow, but the stripes are thin. So each color is only four rows back and forth. So, I have done almost the whole first big part of the shawl. There is a little border that will be next, and I think that I get to take it, <clears throat> sorry, I think I get to bind it off the needles, I think, before I do that border. Not entirely sure. but So we'll see when we get there. But I'm so close. I've got um, three more color stripes to do plus the cream colored ones in between. So there's a total of 24 contrasting color stripes. <clears throat> Sorry guys, a little bit of a cold today. There's a total of 24 contrasting stripes and so I've got 21 done. So I just have three more to go um, and then yeah, then I'll be up to the border, which 
is very similar to the way that Stephen West did the border on shawlography. So I will insert a picture of the painting rainbow shawl so you can see the border I'm talking about. It's still striped, but they just go like this way, um, vertically. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for. So it's just, uh, yeah, this, this is just my favorite thing right now that I'm working on. And it's, it's mindless. It's just like increasing at the start of each row. And then you just go and you slip the last three stitches because there's an I cord edge, which is so nice. So here's the I cord edge, which looks really nice and neat. I don't know if you guys can see that, but, and I'm doing the Weave and Steven on the back. So when I change my colors, so these are technically all Weave and Steven woven in already. So I'll just snip, that's the word. I was going to say slip. I'll snip them after I block my shawl and that'll be that. I won't have any ends to weave in, which will be so nice. So yeah, this is another project that is on my lingering whips list. So this is going to be a big finish when it is done. It's also going to serve as a sample knit for my stop, drop and knit naturally dyed yarn shop. So yeah, I just, I think it's such a happy way to show all of the different colors that the mushroom yarns can give. Yeah, I love it. It makes me so happy. So. Uh, I love this thing so much. <laughs> so yeah. So that is everything. For the whips that I've been working on but of course I had a couple of brand new cast-ons so my whips list has now expanded but that's okay because they are shiny new projects and I love a good shiny new project so let's move on into casting on I'm gonna take lots of tea breaks today because my nose is all stuffed up and I keep heating up my tea so that I can get like the, the steam, I'm trying to loosen things up. So lots of tea breaks, probably lots of editing as I am also going through quite a bit of tissues this episode. So not so fun. <laughs> Okay, let's try this again. My camera stopped recording because my memory card was full, so I had to go and delete last podcast episode off of there. I always forget to do that before I start recording. <sighs> okay. I think I'm going to start with the project that I am most excited to get cast on. I have just knit a swatch so far, but I am always looking for projects to knit with my naturally dyed yarns. And particularly when I dye yarn with the mushrooms, I cannot get like a full sweater quantity out of one mushroom because you just need way too much mushroom quantity to dye, uh, weight of fiber to get really good saturated color. So I always end up with these single skeins, maybe two skeins if I'm really lucky with great color, um, of yarn and <clears throat> it's hard to know. I always end up with these really beautiful single skeins of yarn and it can be really difficult to know what to do with them. For my shop, what I do is I tend to dye mini skeins so that I can put together kits. So I do have uh, lots of mini skein mushroom dyed yarn kits in my shop. So you guys can check those out, even some with these exact colors that I'm going to show you. Uh, so these four yarns, these four colors were all dyed with mushrooms. And I did these back in October, I think. And 
Um, yeah, I have been looking for something to do with them because this is a new base that I have been testing out for my shop. I did knit the shifty, no, the shift along, the shift along hat with um, one of my mini skein sets out of the same base, but I wanted to see how it was going to work in like a stockinette design. So all of these four I had in single skeins and I did want to save some for myself and have another shop sample for my shop. So I kept all of these. This beautiful green and the brown both came from a mushroom called the Lephora terrestris. You guys, I am in no way a mycologist. I am a learn as I go and have no idea how to pronounce these things type of natural dyer here. So yeah, the app tells me it is the Lephora terrestris. And so, yeah, so I was able to get both of these really, really gorgeous colors. The green was by raising the pH and making it more basic and the brown was by making it a more acidic pH. So just by changing the acidity of the dye bath, I was able to get two different colors. So I had those two colors and then I finally found for the very, very first, I'm dropping everything, for the very first time uh, this fall, I finally found a Dyer's polypore mushroom. And I, I only was able to dye a couple skeins with it because I didn't have that much. But I dyed this amazing golden, golden yellow with it. And there are some of this color also, and the two that I just showed you, and the next one available in some of my uh, baby alpaca, this is baby alpaca base, sport weight, mini skein sets on my website. So if any of these look beautiful to you, because I just love these so much, I think they're gorgeous. There are still several, several sets available in like different combinations of colors. And then this one is purple. It's like a dusty purple. Oh my gosh, it is so pretty. And this was done with a type of coral mushroom and it's called Remaria. And for this one, you have to pre-mordant the yarn with iron before you put it into the dye bath. Rather than change the color in an iron after bath, you're doing the iron step at the start of the process. So that is just the little bit of natural dyeing for the uh, casting on section here. But I had these four mushroom dyed yarns and I was looking for a pattern and I also had two other colors. So this one, not, not a mushroom dyed yarn, but this one I did with uh, sassafras. It was actually an exhaust bath that I used from the Life on Long Island natural dye collaboration that I did for Tabitha in October. And this one was dyed with um, black walnut exhaust bath also that I did from the Long Island Life on Long Island collaboration in November. So these two are not mushroom dyes but they look beautiful together. So I've got those two and I had these four. So I had these six skeins and it's a sport weight yarn 100% baby alpaca so I mean, I know about knitting with 100% baby alpaca, but it's so soft and lovely. So I was looking for a pattern and I just, I had it in my head that I wanted to knit Andrea Mowry's stripes sweater with these yarns because I figured I had enough with all the different colors together to do a really nice like stripey sweater. And so I made a swatch and I'm, I'm so excited with how it turns out. So here it is. Oh my gosh, look how beautiful those colors look together. I'm so happy with it. Um, so I did my swatch in the round. So I swatched in the round. So it kind of looks like a really wonky sleeve 
right now and I did it this way because I didn't want to have to cut the yarn into a million little pieces so I just carried the yarn in back and so I have like all these long strands so I'm gonna probably keep this as you know for right now as a sample for my shop this is something easy that I can carry with me it's so nice and drapey so uh, the alpaca is so pretty um, but I also so I did the swatch for two reasons number one because it's it's good to be a good knitter and do the right thing that you're supposed to do by knitting a gauge swatch and I also wasn't sure like what the gauge was going to look like because to me the yarn seems a little bit less than a sport weight like maybe heavy fingering but it did work I have um used uh, the exact needle size that Andrea recommends in the pattern I think it's a five I'm I might have that wrong. I think it's a five and a three for the ribbing then. Um, so I started with that and I'm right on gauge. So I'm really happy that I was able to get gauge. So I feel confident using this yarn for this project. And also because I wanted to see like what order I wanted the colors in because I was having a hard time deciding what order they were gonna go in. So I'm using actually the black walnut is just going to be used for the ribbing so it'll be used at the neckline for the cast on ribbing so I guess like it's really going to be like in this order because we cast on from the neck down so it'll be like that and then the next color after the mushroom brown is going to go back to the purple so I think that that's going to look really really nice I love how the brown and purple look together and I figured that this brown is, I can hold the skeins up a little bit. Let me just get, it'll be easier this way. So this one is the black walnut, the darker one. And the lighter brown is the mushroom brown. And they both look really, really nice with the purple. So I thought that just doing that order of things would look really nice and then um, yeah, all of the ribbing is going to be with the black walnut, and so that's what I'm doing. I cannot wait to cast this on, but I was waiting until after I showed you guys my swatch, and yeah, I just wanted to sit with it for a few days, make sure I was really happy with it. I haven't blocked the swatch. I don't know. I don't feel like doing that stuff. I'm not going to. I'm just going to trust it. But I'm super excited about this one. My favorite thing is knitting with the yarns that I dye myself. It just makes me feel really happy and accomplished and just really proud. And I don't know, like these are like some of these are mushrooms that I have never worked with before, like the green and the and this brown, the Thalephora terrestris. I had never worked with before and so I successfully was able to get that green. The Dyer's Polypore was my first Dyer's Polypore mushroom and I had done uh, dyeing with the Romaria before but last time I worked with it I didn't have that much of a mushroom so my color was much much paler and this time when I found it I found like so much Romaria that I was able to dye three or four skeins with it. So. I have divvied up the other ones and actually I used, I think I just had the mini skeins so I dyed them as mini skeins. So I put uh, mini skein sets together. I will insert those here after I finish talking about this project so you guys can see what is available in the shop for my sport weight yarns that I just showed you here today in case you're interested. Um, I should do that. I should do that maybe at the end of the video and I can do that at the end with the um, the minis, the mushroom minis, like similar to the painting rainbow shawl that I showed you a little while ago. So maybe I'll put those in at the end so you can uh, have an idea if there's anything over there that you're interested in. Okay, so that is the first of two brand new cast-ons. And then, so that one's going to be a bigger project. So I'm going to balance that one out now with another smaller project 
and one that I dug into my stash for. So, several years ago, I purchased a whole bunch of yarn on somebody's D stash, and I walked away with this like one random skein of Brooklyn Tweed Quarry, and it's gorgeous, but it's a bulky yarn, and it is color citrine, I think is what it was called. I don't know if you can see like all the really, really beautiful colors in there. But uh, this has just been sitting in my stash for a good five or six years, probably four or five years, several years it's been there. So I wanted to knit a hat. And so I was thinking that I wanted to knit the Manhattan hat by Tori Yu. And I seemed to remember that she had knit up that hat in a bunch of different yarn weights. So I checked the Manhattan bulky and Quarry was actually one of the yarns recommended for the pattern. So I grabbed my skein of Quarry and I cast on and I've not gotten very far. <laughs> I am knitting the adult size small because I do have a very small head. Owen and I, we can pretty much like, I can pretty much fit in a children's hat, but it looks ridiculous. So adult small is a really good hat option for me. I think there were like three or four kids sizes and three different sizes for adults. So I went with the smallest adult size and I had to refresh my memory on how to do a tubular cast on. And it's actually really fun. I've done it several times. It's one of those things that I never can remember how to do. So I always have to look it up and um, it was really easy. And yeah, I just now need to knit I think it's is it one by one yeah it's one by one ribbing the cast on looks like really neat I don't know if you guys can be able to see it but the cast on edge looks really neat and then this is what the ribbing is looking like so far and I pretty much just did an inch an inch and a half maybe and that's all I've gotten done so I'm really looking forward to working on this this week. I think this is going to be probably one of the main things that I pick up at least to take with me because it's it's small and portable and I don't know. I always bring the painting rainbow shawl with me too but it takes like I need a good 45 minutes to even get like one row done on that shawl. So this would be something like where if I didn't have a lot of time to just sit, then I could just bring this one and not get stuck like in the middle of a 400 stitch row or something. So this is going to be my take with me knitting for the time being. And I'm really excited to get another yarn out of my stash and soon onto my head. Oh, okay. So that's four whips, I think, right? Four whips. Yeah. Four whips that I've got going on right now that I'm focusing on. I hope that next week I will have the other sleeve done on my hush sweater. So maybe that will be what I'm wearing next time I podcast, I hope. And probably have this hat done as well. And probably not too much beyond that. I'll be mid projects with the others. Okay. So that brings an end to all the knitting content today. I think we should go into spinning. Let's talk about spinning. I'm so excited to share this with you guys. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I got these Carters. I think they're Ashford. Yeah, these are Ashford Carters and they're the ones with a super high uh, teeth count, tooth count. There's lots of teeth in them. I think it's like 191 or something. And so this is like, you want a really lot of teeth to card really delicate fibers like Angora. And I think these are actually advertised as cotton carders. So I've never carded cotton or actually anything before this. So I don't know much about that, but I 
finally after having them for months i finally got them out and i have been making little rolex out of felix's wool oh my goodness i'm gonna show you so i have been i have been putting them all in this little look at that look at how many little rolex i have oh my goodness it's so soft they're like these little teeny tiny clouds oh. so i actually have <clears throat> a few different colors and these are all from felix at different different parts of his wool so i'll just show you um most of them are like oh they're so cute they're like little cinnamon buns almost so there's one that's a little bit of a darker gray and one that has a lot more white in it. And that's because this one came more from his belly fur, like his underneath on his sides. And this had more of like his back fur. So I'll try to insert a couple pictures of Felix. He is what they call the color black bunny. So when they're born as babies, when his fur grows in, the first time it's very, very dark, almost black. And then as he matures into an adult bunny, it turns more like salt and peppery. And so his face stays very dark gray, blackish, and the rest of his wool turns like a light gray and a medium gray. These are like, you can't even feel these things. They're so light. So I, I need to get back to this. I haven't made roll eggs in maybe over a week now, but they were so fun. It is really addictive. And I have so much wool because, let's see, I think I've given Felix at least three haircuts so far i think i just am on haircut number four with him but i'm saving anything that i do with his wool like from 2004 i'm gonna deal with that separately so basically this is like everything i mean i have still bags to go through and make into rolex but this is gonna be everything for like our first months together like his first not quite full year of life he was born oh my gosh i need to look up what day his birthday is coming up felix it's almost your birthday i want to say he was born on february 12th i forget that he was born in february because i couldn't bring him home until he was eight weeks and so i brought him home in april and so i have to i have to look up what his birthday was maybe it wasn't the 12th maybe it was like february 23rd or something it is this month though for sure so oh my gosh my first little bunny baby is almost one he's so cute so yeah so i don't know how many i've made maybe 30 or something but i am uh, i'm so excited to finally spin with it uh yeah so i don't know do i have any really dark ones from like his baby wool in here i don't think so um most of the time like their their initial coat isn't really great quality spinning i mean not most of the time like all of the time like the baby coat is not really great spinning quality it's as like that second coat that they grow when they that, uh, yeah, that they grow when they grow, that the second coat that they grow when they grow older. Does that make sense? And now, this is what always happens though, is that the angora, like, it gets in my eye. And so I'm going to like be feeling like I've got something in my eye for the, the whole rest of the podcast. But yeah, I'm just really excited. And this is really, really like... It's like potato chippy. It's like you make one little roll egg and then you just want to make another and another and another. And this is just Felix is like, I love that I get to save his wool and I'm going to turn it into yarn and then I'm going to knit with it. And I don't know. So I don't know what I'm going to do with all of this yet. I 
kind of want to make a yarn that is 100% Felix and I kind of want to make a yarn that is 100% Elmer and then I kind of want to make a yarn that's 50% Felix and 50% Elmer but like all 100% alpaca and I think that that'll be fun to have like just some really special yarn to work with. I know that it will be easier to make yarn that has memory to it because alpaca has no memory so it'll it'll stretch out so I have to be like really careful what I knit out of it if I'm not mixing it with wool and I definitely have angora in my eye now so we're gonna go investigate that in a second but yeah I think just for these first yarns that I make I just want to see what the bunny's yarn looks like on its own and then probably as I eventually spin more yarn I'll probably just start mixing it with some merino and creating a yarn that is is more of a blended yarn that I can knit more practical items with like hats and stuff like that so I'm just so excited that I'm finally after all this time doing something with it and yeah so it's a process it's a really long process but we're getting there and I don't have a spinning wheel I I'm debating getting my uh, e-spinner out to work with the Angora, so we'll see, because that I can have, you need a really fast twist, I believe, to work with the Angora, so at least I need a really fast twist, really, yeah, really fast twisted yarn, like, words, you guys, on my drop spindle, with the fiber that I've been working with so far, which Fair, fair enough, it's his baby fiber, so that it's very short staple length, but it needs to be heavily twisted to, to get those fibers to hold together. So anyway, we'll see. I have no experience with this. I'm just having so much fun, and they're my babies. Okay, so that is actually all I have for spinning today. I didn't actually spin anything this week. I've just been making these cute little roll legs, and yeah, the whole rest of the podcast is going to be talking about some things that are coming up with natural dyeing and taking a little bit of a deeper dive for just a couple minutes into different types of lichen. So that sounds interesting. Stick around. You're going to want to see these colors actually for sure. So before we get into the natural dyeing, I wanted to share a little bit about some dyeing that I did with Owen with snow and Kool-Aid. A couple weeks ago, we had a little tiny bit of snow, not too much. Um, and now Groundhog today has predicted an early spring. So not sure we're gonna get that much snow this year either, we'll see. But there was enough to do a little bit of snow dyeing, and it hadn't snowed since 2022, actually. Like November 2022, I think, was the last time we got like any snow in our little area of Long Island here, and it also wasn't much. The lack of snow is actually pretty unusual for our area, but it has been quite a while since we've gotten like any kind of significant snowstorm here. So I knew that since we had a little bit of snow to work with, it was time to dig out the Kool-Aid and give Owen a couple skeins of my yarn. It turned out really, really pink, like so pink, you guys. <laughs> it's like Pepto-Bismol pink. Oh my gosh. We used a red, yellow, blue, and purple packet. So we used four different packets of Kool-Aid but the blue turned out to be Tropical Punch, and so the blue turned out to also be red. And so just between the red and the pink, that just overtook everything. So we just ended up with some really, really pink yarn. And I also let Owen do all of the sprinkling of the Kool-Aid on the yarn. I'll unravel these so that you can see a little bit better what they look like. This one has some yellow peeking out right over there. Not much. Um, but yeah, this is the one that had more of the yellow on it. And I don't know if you get to hear that the bunnies are like digging under their pen. 
So I don't know if you guys can see. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's hard to see. Like this lighting is not the greatest. It's, it's honestly, it's not the most beautiful skein of yarn, but um, it does, it has like a couple of little spots in there that do have, that do have some yellow and some more like variegated color. So that's the light one. The last time we dyed with Kool-Aid, or the first time we dyed with Kool-Aid, I actually filmed a really cute tutorial. It was actually three years ago, and we had much better snowfall at that time. And again, it turned out very, very pink. We also must have been heavy on the tropical punch, fruit punch flavors of Kool-Aid at the time. But um, the yarn, that one turned out really, really pretty. I think that he had a bit more yellow in there. And I think I also helped distribute the color a little bit better. But we knit a hippo out of it and it turned out really, really beautifully. So that was really fun. So this is the one that had the purple on it. And honestly, you, you can't see any purple anywhere. Like, I want to say that maybe this is one of the areas that had a little bit, bit of purple and like you, you can't see it at all. Like there is nothing but pink in here at all. So I think um, he wants me to knit him another stuffy and I think he requested a narwhal. And he's actually quite happy with the pink. Pink is currently his favorite color. So that is good. I'd hate for him to not like pink at all and then have all this pink yarn. But this one, like there's, there's definite variegation there, but it's just all pink. <laughs> this one is all pink and this one is all pink. So yeah, this one is a little darker and this one is lighter. But it was fun. It was something to do. I think it was like two weeks ago now, so it was two Saturdays ago that we had that little bit of snow. And so we were just able to enjoy that project again. So that was just a fun afternoon. Okay, so that is all of the non-natural dyeing. But I will, uh, I'll link that tutorial down below for you guys. It is a couple of years ago on my channel now, like in that very first year. So it's way back because we're in year three now of the Stop, Drop, Edit podcast. So exciting. Um, so I'll link the tutorial. It's so cute because he was only six and now he's nine. And so it's always really fun for me to go back and revi like revisit what it was like with him at that time. He was so much, I don't want to say he was cuter then. He's still really cute now, but he definitely has more attitude now than he did when he was six. So yeah, it, it's just, it's really, really cute. And like his speaking wasn't as clear also. So it's, it's just adorable. So if you guys want to watch some cuteness from three years ago, then go check out our tutorial on how to dye with snow and Kool-Aid great project for the grandkids or little toddlers that you guys have around the house. Really fun to do. You just need some good snow. And I recommend more than pink Kool-Aid. So, all right, let's go on to actual natural dyeing now. So we're actually talking about more pink <laughs> yarn, even with the natural dyeing. I'm going to take these down from the shelf. So because I realize it's not all on camera. This is just gonna tumble, I think. Ugh. All right. So I have been dying with my favorite, favorite, favorite mushroom called Cortinarius semi-sanguineus. I was lucky that we had quite a lot of rainfall during the fall months, and so a lot, an abundance of these mushrooms popped up in a couple different parks on Long Island that I was able to forage from. So I am using these mushrooms for the February Life on Long Island natural dye collaboration that I am doing with Tabitha over at Long Island Yarn and Farm. And so 
these particular yarn kits are released over on her website and this month it's going to be a gradient so I have them caked up right now because I need to get these all into mini skeins as I was saying you only can get so much yarn at a super saturated color when you're working with the mushrooms I started out with 200 grams dried mushrooms caps only because that's where all the red pigment is in that particular mushroom and so I separated it into four 50 gram bags and created four separate dye baths and we only release 20 skeins or 20 kits I should say usually they're full-size skeins but because I was only able to work with enough mushroom to get four at this level of saturation I knew that I was going to be making use of all of the exhaust baths. Those mushrooms actually give out tons and tons and tons of color. They really keep giving, but just not at the same intensity. So the second, these, these are in order of uh, dye baths. So the first exhaust bath would be the one underneath the red-ish one. And it's definitely more of like a salmon color. It's got an orange tint to it. And that's because the top of the cap is a brownish color that has some yellow pigment in it. The stems are also a yellowish brown. So because that yellow, <clears throat> that yellow pigment, <clears throat> so because that yellow pigment is also present in the cap on the top side, uh, once the reds all come out, the yellow starts to become a little bit more prominent. And then the third or the second exhaust bath is the one underneath that dark salmon. So that one there. And I was honestly surprised that I kept getting as much pink as I did. And so that is now the third exhaust bath. And I was even able to still get some pink color, very pale pink for the fourth exhaust bath. I was expecting that the fourth color was going to end up being just white, which was still going to be really beautiful. But so these are all going to get divvied up into five 20 gram skeins and mini skeins. And so I've got a lot of work to do over these next few days because these mini skein sets are going to be released on Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time. February 9th. So that is, let's see, this video is coming out on Sunday, the 4th of February. So I think five days until from when you watch this until the release of these. So there's only 20 kits available. I think what she's pairing it with this month. So it is a kit. It's not just the yarn. We also find a Long Island business to support because the yarn is dyed with all materials that I forage from Long Island and her wool is from Long Island. And uh, so we try to also support another small Long Island business. And so she found a business and they do what they call fat ass fudge. So this collaboration is gonna be a five skein mini set of yarn, some fat ass fudge and I'm just looking forward to it so much. I named this one Loving Life. And so life is spelled L-I-Y-F because it stands for Long Island Yarn and Farm. So this month is the Loving Life collaboration. And February 9th at 8 p.m. over on Tabitha's website, longislandyarnandfarm.com or something like that. So that is what I have been up to with the dyeing for like weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, nothing new coming into my shop just yet. I need to get these finished first, but I have started picking up lichen from the ground. <laughs> so I've been foraging for lichen again. The winter dye months are 
you know, there's no mushrooms, there's no flowers, there's like pine cones and acorns and lichens. And so lichens are a really fun natural dye material because you can get a range of beautiful colors, including that bright fuchsia purple that I showed you in the shawl earlier. You just have to make sure that you are always foraging your lichen ethically so you never take it off of an actual like living tree or rock or anything like that. You need to make sure that it is windfall that you are collecting. And so we had a couple of really windy days recently and we've had a couple of rainstorms and yeah, so there's no shortage of lichen in the little park that is just around the block from me right here. And so last weekend, Saturday morning, Owen had a birthday party to go to and they were doing, it was like a theme party. It was a Harry Potter dress up party. They were rented the movie theater downtown and they were watching Chamber of Secrets, which is like three hours long, something like that, like two and a half, two and a half hours. It was a long one and everything is really local right here in town. So I was able to drop him off at the birthday party and while he was watching Harry Potter, Chamber of Secrets, dressed up as Harry Potter, um, I went around the neighborhood into the trails by us and I wandered for like two hours and I collected a whole bunch of different lichens. So when I have collected lichens in the past, it's also always been from windfall. And it was in the backyard at my old home, my parents' old home before they sold it and moved. And I didn't know anything about lichens. I still don't know anything really about lichens. I'm learning though that there are so many, so many, like hundreds, thousands, a lot. There's so many different types of lichen. I didn't think that I had that many types of lichen from what I collected. So when I, I'm gonna show you this one more time. This one, this bright purple one here, was the first skein of lichen that I ever dyed, ever. I must have gotten really, really, really lucky because I didn't know what I was doing. And I just thought that, you know, the green, the green lichen that you see on the oak trees everywhere on Long Island, I knew that if you collected it, you should be able to get purple. Now, I have since dyed with lichen again, what I thought was the same type of lichen, just collecting random lichens and sticking them in a jar and not gotten that purple. And I didn't know what happened because I did everything the same. It turns out that all of those green lichens that I collected are like, there's like 10 different types of lichens that I had like right within those and a bunch of them give purple, but then like this whole other slew of them don't. And I've been like zooming in on the lichens and some of them have like these little like fuzzy black hairs all over them. I had no idea. Like you can see them really well if you zoom in on the camera. So I came home with like, you know, a bag full of lichen and I didn't even take like most of what I saw. I just, you know, there was so many downed branches and a lot of loose lichen on the ground, a lot of branches that, you know, the lichen is going to die anyway, once it's not attached to a living tree anymore. So I don't know, I gathered a bunch of lichen and I came home and I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort through this lichen. I have no idea what I'm doing, but there is one app that works pretty well at identifying them. It's the, I use the Seek app, which is iNaturalist and it, you can get a pretty, pretty good identification. I'm sure it's not foolproof. Most apps are not at all foolproof, but I was so surprised at how many different varieties of lichen I had picked up. I thought that here I only had like two, like 
a ruffly kind and like a flat a flat kind no I had like I've got like 10 different mason jars now filled with different lichens I've been sorting them it is tedious <laughs> I've got masking tape on the jars with the names of the lichens and so they've got like the fun Latin names and then they've got the common names but as I'm doing it more and more I'm actually starting to notice some of the specific things I don't know mushroom foraging so much easier to identify mushrooms than lichens lichens is like it's this whole other level that yeah so I currently outside have like five or six jars full of lichen in ammonia that's been fermenting since the summer and I've not been diligent about taking care of it um and I'm worried that like I didn't sort my lichens at all for those jars I just willy-nilly like I did the first time when I lucked out with that amazing purple I just dumped all the lichen into jars I filled up like five or six jars and dump some ammonia and some water in and shake it and they're like rusted shut now so I can't even open them I've got to work on opening those jars because they've been sitting outside in all the elements since the summer but um I have no idea if I'm gonna luck out with any of those and get a beautiful purple or if they're all gonna be a bust now because I didn't take the time to identify properly what variety of lichen it was and sort them into like appropriate jars so yeah I um I've got like a whole slew of jars on the table my table over there is a cluttered mess right now so I'm not gonna like go get 10 mason jars and show you on camera I had no idea how different some of these things are and I'm slowly starting to like recognize a couple of them like I have a better idea <clears throat> of like I can narrow it down to since I've identified about like 10 different types I'm pretty sure that there's nothing in there that I haven't already figured out in one of those jars so I'm able to kind of guess based on the results that I've had so far now what the lichen sample might be and a lot of the times I'm getting it right so I'm feeling pretty proud of myself. There's like Punctilia rudecta and that, I want to say that that one is like a speckled, rough speckled green shield lichen. But then there's also just a speckled green shield lichen, which has a totally different Latin name. And then there's just a common green shield lichen. And that one I don't think gives you the fun purple color. Fun fact. It doesn't look that different from the fun speckly one though, to me that that does give you the purple color so and then there's these like ruffly ones and it's also like you know if the lichen depending on like the age of the lichen they're dif developed differently some are more fully developed than others and so you know figuring out if it's the, the same lichen but at a younger or older stage so that's a thing and they're so much to learn there is so much to learn so a uh, one little last thing that i'm going to share with you that is coming up that i am really excited to do and i'm going to be sharing this on my channel i'm not planning to share the this the yarns from these experiments in my shop and that is because so i am in a really great facebook group by run by Alyssa Allen and it's it's got like over there were already over 30,000 members and I think it's grown even in the last couple of weeks um, and has like so many more thousands of people in it now but it's a great Facebook group with really a lot of information so if you guys are interested in any of this I definitely recommend joining the mushroom and lichen dyers united group on Facebook really really great group with a lot of really well-informed people and 
lots of lurkers and lots of people kind of in the middle of the process of learning like me like I've had a couple years now of experience dying with mushrooms and lichen but not so much that I'm definitely not one of the experts over there so there's a lot that I'm still learning and it's just a really really great group it stays on topic almost all the time and Alyssa is just really great and really great at running the group and keeping things really healthy in there so I lost my train of thought what was I saying So the thing that I'm really excited about is that Alyssa announced a challenge to do a lichen dye experiment, but instead of using ammonia, we are going to be collecting our own urine as the people did back in the day before you could just purchase ammonia. And so the experiment that I'm going to do is I'm gonna do a jar of my urine with one specific type of lichen I'm gonna like I'm I'm sorting my lichens now so I'm gonna make sure that I have the same exact type of lichen in the jar and one jar I'm gonna use my urine the other jar I'm gonna use Owens because everything that I have read is that the best most desirable urine to use for natural dyeing is the urine of prepubescent boys and I'm living with a prepubescent boy so I'm like I've got to see if there's any difference so that's gonna be like my personal <laughs> experiment and I am so ridiculously excited about this so right now I'm sorting my lichens I've not yet collected our urine because I also was advised that to really do the experiment well and as accurately as possible, we should eat the same exact foods before collecting the samples. And now this is going to be challenging, actually, because Owen's foods consist of, like, chicken nuggets, grilled cheese with, like, Velveeta or Kraft singles, like, American grilled cheese, and, like, white bread. I like a good grilled cheese sandwich, but I don't like... Velveeta or Kraft like singles cheese. I like good different types of cheese. Um, he eats only like either cheese pizza or white pizza. So I don't really like cheese pizza. I do like white pizza. So maybe we'll have to go out and have white pizza. Um, and things like goldfish crackers and candy and, you know, apple juice. And that awful prime drink. Oh, that thing is so gross. Prime. I don't know why kids like that drink so much. It's kind of disgusting. So to get us to eat the exact same things one day is going to be really challenging. I also have to have my daily coffee. And usually, not every night, but often I'll have a beer after dinner, like after bedtime at some point. So it's going to be a night where I like need to skip a beer and, you know, I, I can't skip the coffee. I might have to let the kid have some coffee too, which I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, yeah, so there's, there's some planning that needs to happen on the menu end of things to get us eating the same food. So basically, I'm going to have to do a lot of compromising because I don't think he's going to eat super interesting things <laughs> and drink anything other than apple juice or water and I'm not drinking prime so he's he's not going to be allowed to do that for this challenge because that's just gross so anyway so I'm super excited about that I think that that is I don't think I know that that is everything I have to share with you guys today so it was a long one as always, as usual, I'm good for a good like hour long podcast all the time. I hope you all enjoyed spending some time with me today. And yeah, uh, let's see. Groundhog says it's going to be an early spring. So yay, boo. I don't know. Is he going to be right? Is he going to be wrong? No idea. But 
I'm recording this on Groundhog Day, so I figured it's it's kind of relevant. I mean, he hasn't predicted an early spring, like, hardly ever, so could happen. We're certainly not having that much snow, so it is pretty cold out, though, still. We got some time. So anyway, I hope that everybody is happy and healthy and enjoying knitting or spinning or dyeing or just sitting here drinking a coffee or some kind of other beverage, whatever you've got going on. I hope you enjoyed your time together and thank you so much for tuning in. Subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.